Well, that is, uh, I think that is a, a picture you have just painted for all of us um, that will last in terms of those women in the prison making our American flag. So yeah. uh, thank, thank you. you for sharing that. Thank you. Before I turn my attention um, to you, Senator, I do want to just um, take advantage of the microphone being on for me to, yeah. you know, thank Holly for being yes. a leading force. Um, I want to thank um, Nicole from, so the U.S. Je Justice Network, the um, Brennan Center, Nicole. Mm -hmm. um, there's Mark, Louise, and Jenny for Coke for all that they do to keep our consciousness focused. And, and I just want to say to everybody in this room, when, when Malika Sadrasar, who is our human rights um, uh, attorney at Google, came and, and you know, asked us about supporting this and being a part of it, I, you know, one of my concerns was the worst thing that can happen, particularly in this town, is when you have an event like this and if there were empty chairs, right? We want to <laughs> reinforce that this is, and so to have a room full of people with overflow, to me, just um, really sends the right message. And so I just wanted to say to all of you, thank you for being here, because I'm, I'm sure, for, whether it's Senator Harris, Senator Booker, I know Governor Fallon's going to be speaking, yeah. the members of Congress who are coming forward, they're not, you know, I, I can guess that you don't get a lot of questions on this for your town hall meetings, that, nope. you know, you're not, your phones aren't flooded with, you know, no. calls about that, right? The, the women in the Chowchilla prison cannot reach out to you. So yeah. it is not the issue that the elected officials that are here are not picking this up because it is the politically right. popular thing That's to right. do. And so um, I just want to sort of applaud all of you for taking such a leadership role um, that oftentimes the populations, all the time, yeah. the populations um, who are most affected right. um, are not the ones that are mm -hmm. scoring you mm -hmm. um, for re-election or for financial contributions. Mm -hmm. And so that says a lot about your hearts and your minds. So I want to thank you particularly for... Um, and of course, like I could spend all day when you talk about we need to be smart. Honestly, you all know this. There's nobody smarter on this issue than Senator Harris. Um, and part of it is because she has just worked so hard um, throughout her career and focused on this. And part of it is, as we in Google love you so much because you're so data driven. Yes. Um, and that's, that's you, can't argue, you can't argue with the numbers, right? Um, so you talked a lot a bit about um, what I wanted to ask you, but let's just start with, and I think I know the answer, but so women being incarcerated has grown over more than 700% over the last few decades. Yeah. And, I, and I think we can guess as to what the reason is, but also why has it taken it so long as a nation to have noticed that growth? Yeah. You know, you said it. Um, we are talking about a population of people that are for the most part invisible. They don't have any political capital. They're not writing checks. They're not voting. And also, here's the challenge um, in terms of criminal justice policy. It is a challenge to have people care about somebody who has committed a crime. Yeah. Let's just deal with the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. um, but you see, you know, in many African countries, there's a greeting. When you meet someone for the first time, you don't say, pleased to meet you. You say, I see you. Hmm. Yeah. I see you in your full, right, multidimensional being. So on this issue, it is so important that rather than thinking of these women as somebody who has committed a crime and therefore undeserving of our attention, mm -hmm. that we see them in their full being and understand all that got them to that place. And, and the fact that most of them are coming out, yeah. that they are mothers, that they have a natural desire to parent their children, even if they don't have all the skills that are necessary, mm -hmm. and that there is, it, is worth, it is worthwhile for us morally and, and fiscally to invest in them, to be all that they can be. It is important that we understand that it's not only about having them serve their time, but thinking about how they use their time mm -hmm. in prison so that we can actually change the odds when they come out. But the data piece, I'll tell you, um, I am, I'm obsessed with data. When I was um, Attorney General of California, so we kept, you know, as one of the, as the largest state in terms of population in the country, 
um, the, the Department of Justice, State Department of Justice, we maintained an extraordinary amount of criminal justice data because local jurisdictions, police, sheriffs, courts had to report that data to mm -hmm. us. And what we generally do as government is we collect data and then we put it in some room and it gathers dust and we don't look at it again. But the beauty, Google, of technology is that you know, we can now analyze large amounts of data in a way that can really drive better public policy mm -hmm. and smarter public policy. You know, when I came out of law school, we had big data, and I'll tell you what that looked like. It was a really tall aluminum <laughs> file cabinet <laughs> with thousands of files. Right. That was big data. Yeah. Now we can write code to process all that information and engage in predictive policy, you know, figure out what are the patterns, what's going on in there. And so, but in order to do that, we have to collect the data, we have to collect the right data, and then we have to analyze it. And so we did that and we, we created an initiative in California, an open data initiative that I called Open Justice, where we shared that. I strongly, strongly believe that on this issue and so many others, we need to have a commitment that government has a responsibility to collect the data and share it. And here's what I, I purposely am saying. I didn't say and analyze it because if we're pushing it to that point, we may not get there very soon and we need to get to yeah. the better place sooner than later. And so I know that within government, we don't necessarily have the bandwidth or the skill set to analyze all that data. Uh -oh. That's the, <laughs> we just don't. No, Let's I be honest, it. right? Yeah, absolutely. So, but, but this is the beauty of open data. You public source it. I so the point has to be to say to government, stop hiding that data and holding on to it or making yep. us scratch to get it out because the journalists have to do a public records request. Mm. Share it. Yeah, it'll render you a bit vulnerable. None of us like to have our stuff just hanging all out there. But, but the reality is that it will actually allow us, embarrassing though it may be, mm -hmm. it will allow us then to be smarter with the limited resources we have. Let's have open data initiatives around what's going on with incarcerated women. Mm -hmm. So everyone in this room, and I know there are foundations here and there are think tanks and that we can all, you each can pick off mm -hmm. a piece of it and say, I'm gonna dive into that mm -hmm. and figure out what's going on so we can be smarter and have a better return on our investment. Now is that part of it, does that require legislation? Uh, I guess it just requires the Justice Department to. I think. The, well, I did it. I was AG. Uh, you know. Yeah. There are all kinds of things you can do without asking permission. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I loved that. Thank you. I, um, it, it's, so I, I guess I just want to spend two, a few more minutes. You've discussed this, but to really underscore. Rise in prison population, yeah. the connection that you've yeah. used for data, uh, um, using data mm -hmm. to the fact that, you know, what overwhelmingly the women who are incarcerated yeah. are, are for nonviolent yeah. crimes yeah. Um, and that, um, and have a background of sexual, of trauma, yeah. usually sexual yeah. trauma. And then you carry that to the fact that the overwhelming majority of them have children. Yeah. How do we deal, deal with that? with yeah. all, knowing all that. And yeah. I guess particularly, how do we develop a national strategy for how we do with their children? Yeah. So there are, your question raises a lot of points. Um, so I'll unpack a little bit of it. Um, I, when I was a courtroom prosecutor, um, there was a time, in addition to homicides and other cases, where I specialized in child sexual assault cases. Mm -hmm. They're awful. Yeah. These are awful. And, um, you know, I would, I would urge everyone to think about the issue of child sexual assault the way we thought about the issue of domestic violence mm -hmm. about 40 years ago. Yep, I agree. So there was a time where we decided what the king does in his castle is his business. Mm -hmm. It's not our business. Right. We will not get involved. That's between family. Yep. And then, Remember that. by the way, as more women became prosecutors and cops and judges, we said, no, she's got a black eye and her teeth have been knocked mm -hmm. out. That's not just between them. And we need to then deal with it, but we also need to talk about it and we need to remove the stigma mm -hmm. associated with it because it happens, it is a fact. 
Child sexual assault, I would suggest, guys, is still in that place where people don't really talk yeah. about it. And it makes everyone uncomfortable, understandably, mm -hmm. and we do not talk about it. We, we, we need to do a lot more to encourage victims and survivors to, to, to come out and talk about what they've experienced and, and, and for, if no other reason, so they can get help. Mm -hmm. And so that when we talk about it more, we realize that it's more pervasive than we would like to admit. Mm -hmm. And we don't actually have enough in terms of resources being put into helping mm -hmm. survivors. So, you know, that's a very specific... Really going, but going straight to the rape. But I think we need yeah. to... That's one of the conversations yeah. we need to have. And that I put in the category of just crimes against women and girls, and boys, by the way, also. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, that we just still haven't, we still haven't, I think, matured or progressed on that to the place where we should be. Um, there is the other piece about uh, getting um, support for families, yeah. and we, our foster care system is broken mm -hmm. as a country. It really is. Oh, it's, yep. And, you know, again, talk about a population of people that mm -hmm. have no power. Absolutely. And the, and the data is so clear. It is, it is very possible, if not likely, that a child in the foster care system will end up in the juvenile justice system and then the criminal justice system. Right. And we've got to do more to, to address that. And in particular, I think we have to do more to understand that we cannot, we, we have to stop being so paternalistic about children in need. Mm -hmm. And here's what I mean about that. Oh, I could parent that child better than she's doing. Instead of understanding you really want to help that child, help that child in the context of the family in which that child is being raised, which means help that family. Yeah. You know, paternalistic, where, you know, there's an underlying assumption that, that these women and men don't want to parent their children. Mm -hmm. That is wrong. Yeah. It is just actually incorrect. They have a natural desire to parent their children well but not necessarily the skills or the resources. Mm -hmm. So in terms of public policy, let's approach it from that perspective and understand. We have a dearth of parenting classes available mm -hmm. to young parents. I mean, of any socioeconomic status, by the way. But some get by because the resources are naturally around them. Right. And others don't because there are no resources there, but it has nothing to do with the love that that parent has for that child or that that family has for that child. So, you know, there is that. And I, but, you know, there is another piece of what you're talking about that is also that we have continued to... First of all, the war on drugs was an abject failure. Mm. And we still continue, and especially with this guy talking about reviving the war on drugs, it's crazy. Um, it, the, dr th this issue, we made a mistake when decades ago we decided to criminalize what is a public health matter. Right. Yep. And women are suffering mm -hmm. in that system, as are men, where whole populations of people have been incarcerated for what is essentially a public health issue. Right. And we got to deal with that. And so when you look at the, the statistics around the number of women who are incarcerated for nonviolent mm -hmm. offenses that are almost entirely connected with drugs and drug abuse, uh, we, have to, we have to understand. And again, the data will help make this more clear. We all know it. We know it anecdotally. Those of us who have looked at data know it, but more people need to be aware of it. Well, and, and to your point that, that you discussed earlier, when people, elected officials, et cetera, wanting to not be seen as tough, on, as, as weak on crime, yeah, right. the data will prove um, a different story right. um, and allow them to, who are not as brave as you, to speak out? Well, we've, we're, over the years, we rewarded, you know, we, so in elections, you know this, um, there is a general appetite. You want, you want to elect people who are going to be leaders, and we have decided that someone will be a leader if they're tough. Mm -hmm. And, but what we have done is we've made the mistake of, 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 uh, of confusing tough talk for tough action. Mm -hmm. Tough action on this point is to reduce the number of women that are going to prison. You bet. You bet. 
Well, I don't think anybody confuses lock them up. I, I don't think anybody confuses you with the tough problem there. Yeah, I right. think we, I think that's <laughs> yeah. that's clear. Um, I know that you have been um, focused on the challenges of money bail, yes. and particularly when it comes to, yes. to to women and pretrial detention. Yes, you know, you gave us a, a little yeah. example there. Can you discuss that for a yeah. bit with us? So I'm working on a bill um, to encourage reform of the money bail system in our country. So essentially, here's the deal. Um, we have gotten to the point where in courtrooms around America, someone is released before their trial based on whether they can afford to write the check or not, and not necessarily based on whether they present a risk to their community. Mm -hmm. Right? So that ain't right. It's not fair. And we need to, we need to get to a point, but it is an absolutely legitimate question about if you are released, will you create harm or havoc in your community? That we definitely need to do. And if somebody is a risk to anybody, then they need to stay in jail and regardless deal with of their ability and deal with to the pay. Cons regardless, but it has to be regardless of their ability to pay. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. You know, and so I, you know, I've seen very sophisticated um, members of organized gangs can write big checks. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, you know, the woman we're talking about, yeah. she can't write a check for anything. And so she sits in jail, and then all of these things happen. She might lose her children. She might, you know, not be able to go to work. And, um, and you know, and, and right now, because a lot of courts are facing backlogs, people sit in jail pretrial for years in some places. Years. So it's a very real issue. Mm -hmm. And so the bill will basically create um, a grant to incentivize, and we're, we're suggesting we'd start with six states, and they'd have to compete for the grant money to do an analysis of their bail reform um, program and then, uh, and then propose solutions, mm -hmm. creative solutions, so we can get on the road of reforming this system. And so we want to start with basically in creating grants as an incentive for pilots to be created that can be models for the entire country. Thank you. I want to end. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I could like talk to you forever um, on this issue. And I and could I'll talk probably, forever. And I'll, <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the topic of, of this, you know, women unshackled, obviously we're talking about it in, in so many ways, um, in, in, real, in real ways and metaphorically. Um, mm -hmm. But the right. point being that there are still eight states where women are shackled in this country while they're giving birth. Right. Um, and, and to me, the, the thought of, first of all, that anybody thinks that you're going to escape while you're giving birth is someone who has never given birth before. Um, but you think about not, not only that woman who is going, going through that with everything that's going on in her heart and head as, as she's giving new life. Right. But, you know, you just can't help to know. I know that, you know, that child is a moments old, um, but to be brought into That's life. Right. That's um, right. Under a, a circumstance like that is just I agree. Um, it's inhuman. devastating. And it just, I cannot believe that we do that still here. You know, we are. It's treating human beings like animals. Yeah. So and what do we? What can we do about that? Well, this. Yeah. What we're doing right now. This is this is really important. You know, literally in our, looking at our nation's capital, with the the firepower that's in this room, mm -hmm. the heavy hitters that are in this room, and giving voice to those women, um, so that they also know that. You know, we are aware that they're in that room right now, yeah. shackled and giving birth. And we're not going to let it just be in that room. We're going to take it to the streets. We're going to talk about it. And, you know, and we, all of us as a community, as part of a civil society, are going to advocate for just smarter public policy on this issue. And that's really what it is, smarter public policy. It's not smart to do some of these things. You think that child's not going to know at some point right. that this is how they came into the world? Exactly it. And think what that means that. in terms of that child and that child's um, sense of identity. And dignity. And sense of dignity and sense of purpose and, and belonging. 
Anyway, I, yeah, so I think, how about if we end on an optimistic note? Okay, you go. <laughs> you go, let's do this. Yes. Um, Please bring us back to so home. I, I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying. I, what I say is we can only go up from here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there is so much to be done, though. And, and, I know, and, and I've seen the list of all of the incredible people who are going to be part of the panels during the course mm -hmm. of the day. And I just say to everyone, listen intently. Um, let's all take notes and, and then, fig you know, and then at the end of this, and I'm sure there's some idea where we could, you know, maybe triage and figure out what are the top three things that has come out of today, yep. you know, of the many good ideas where we want to put the limited resources and firepower we have into some very specific proposals around reform. Right. And, but the advocacy, the sharing of information are critical to getting to that place. So, so thank you I, So I'm gonna end on a positive note. Kamala Harris is in the United States Senate. How is that for positives? <laughs> so thank you. thank you so much. Thank you.